It's this relationship that he makes possible where you can come to him with a, a sense that you're, you're right to be there, that, that there is an a approach that you can make in prayer that God accepts. I, I love that phrase, Abba, Father. Every time I read it in Scripture, it breaks, takes me back to a moment. I've told a story before when we were uh, on a, a boat in the middle of the Mediterranean, and uh, we're there with, we were supposed to have the boat all to ourselves with the group I was with. It was supposed to be a private cruise, but for some reason, the boat captain decided there was room to add some more paying customers and make a little bit more money on this, and so he invited another family along, and it was an Israeli family. And uh, they were on the boat. They didn't seem to speak much English, and we kind of were off on our own, feeling like, oh, this is supposed to be our cruise. And uh, we come to this one place, and we had planned to stop in a particular area and go swimming. Well, that message hadn't gotten passed along to the Israeli couple much, but it didn't stop them. They stripped down to their underwear, and they jumped right into the water with us, and uh, are having a great old time, and the little kids are looking at the boat, and they're saying, Abba, 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 right? Daddy, Daddy, look at me. You know, I'm swimming in the water. Here I am. I want your attention. Just normal daddy interaction with the kids. That's what the Spirit wants. He wants you to know that you can come to God and you can cry out for His attention. That he wants to listen to you. He will hear you. That's the Spirit. That's the gift of the Spirit. And whatever else comes along with that relationship, right, is gravy once, once you understand God's heart for you, his attention. The job of the Spirit, Spirit-directed prayer, is to have you experience that kind of moment with Jesus and his Father. Spirit-directed prayer. Hmm. In another uh, letter that John Bunyan wrote, he described prayer this way. Prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate, pouring out of the heart and soul to God through Christ in the strength and assistance of the Holy Spirit. For such things as God has promised, or according to the word of God, for the good of the church, with submission and faith to the will of God. Did you get that? You want to hear that again? Okay, I'll read it again. Prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate, pouring out of the heart and soul to God through Christ in the strength and assistance of the Holy Spirit. For such things as God has promised, or according to the word of God, for the good of the church, with submission in faith to the will of God. Pray in the Spirit. Secondly, this is consistent, dependent prayer, right? It says, and pray on all occasions, all prayers at all, all times, right? This is talking about prayer as a sense that you and I are connected to God. In a sense, it's the Spirit. It's part of the activity of the Spirit that goes with us, but it, it's, it's an expression of how we live, where our life comes from in each moment. Remember, Jesus said, I am the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. We think, wow, I can, I can do all sorts of things, right? I can do it. I really, a lot of us go through a lot of life thinking we got it under control. In this verse, Jesus says, really, in those moments, what you're doing adds up to nothing. It's nothing in God's eyes until you take a sense of dependence into those moments, an awareness of God, a, a, a thing that says to us that it's about God, even in this place and in this moment. It's a connection of a vine and branches kind of connection. That's prayer. That's prayer. That's the kind of reason we put on the armor with prayer, right? Each piece we put on with prayer, the belt of truth comes where we, we mull it over and, and in prayer we say, Lord, I acknowledge it to be true for me. And a breastplate of righteousness comes as we say, Lord, I'm so, I need your help to live this out. The shoes 
Help us feel the impact of God's good news to the very bottoms of our feet, to the tops of our, our heads, that, that shield, that, that faith where we say, Lord, I am going to trust you. I'm holding on to you. I am not letting go. The helmet of salvation, our hope, is at the heart of all prayer. Christ's work. That's the Christ that did it for me. That the sword right, of his, of his word helps us to grow in understanding and application of what he tells us. It's processed prayerfully. The reminder comes, it sobers us up. Or James writes, he tells them, hey, you don't have because you don't ask God. You're not connected. You're, you're not bringing it to him. That's so many times in Scripture, right, the, the Bible calls us to this sense of prayer that is to be offered continually, consistently, that to keep us connected to him, right? Some of these were mentioned this morning, right? Romans 12, 12. Went through those fast. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. You got it right, Jamie. Or Colossians 4, 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Oh, that one from 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, a favorite verse of people that had to memorize a verse. Pray continually, right? And Paul is a great example of that, right? He writes to Timothy and he says, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. It's a connection. It's a consistent sense of dependence where that God's our source. We need to draw on him. Prayer, this consistent dependent prayer keeps us conscious of God and awareness that it's not all about me, right? It's not just all about me. It's about Jesus, about what he wants to do for me, what he has done for me, wants to, wants to do through me. The psalmist said, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Brother Lawrence was a medieval monk, right? And he wrote a classic book that's still in our a bookstores today. It's called The Practice of the Presence of God. And he writes, The time of business does not differ with me from the time of prayer. And in the noise and clatter of my kitchen, while several persons are all at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in as great tranquility as if I were on my knees. And the reason the book is a classic is because it's not where most of us live, right? Most of us are easily distracted from God's presence, from his provision for us. And no wonder that the devil finds times where our armor isn't quite ready to repel his attack, where where we live is so different from where Jesus calls us to be. Prayer plays an important role in that. Sometimes if you can begin that way, Begin in the morning with a moment of prayer, a, a place where you begin to set your heart where you want it to be throughout the day. You could begin, sometimes what I say, well begun is a job half, half done, right? For you and I, that could be a great practice for prayer, as prayer keeps us conscious of God. Pray in, pray in the Spirit, right? Live life with God consistently depending on him. There's a real connection that's kept alive by prayer. There's a, a real resource that's a, available only in, in prayer. And it calls for or involves all sorts of different kinds of prayer, right? Paul says, pray with all kinds of prayers and requests. Right? All prayer means like lots of different things. It's just not one kind of prayer. Maybe you remember seeing one of those plaques that uh, have shown up around the area where it says, life is fragile, right? Handle it, handle it with prayer. We need to know, practice prayer in every situation. It, it calls for different kinds of prayer, different days in our lives. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and disputing. And it's not so much about posture as it is about holiness. Right? It's about holy hands more than if we hold them in our lap or we raise them 
to the sky. It wouldn't hurt you to raise your hands if that takes you kind of out of your own kind of focus in the moment. Right? Try a different posture in prayer. If prayer has become difficult for you, try walking down the street and praying for the houses on your block or, or try standing when you pray and lifting your hands. It'll keep you awake if you tend to fall asleep when you pray, right? Different kinds of prayer essential for us. The psalmist said he prayed at all times, right? Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Different kinds of prayer, kinds of confession. When we look at ourselves and look at our wandering heart and say, Lord, I, I did it again. I, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Help me to walk closer to your path. Put my feet back on the way. I want to start again going your way anew. Times of petition where you see the needs in your life and the lives of other people and you ask for those things, to pray for those things. Times of, of thanksgiving where you recognize God's good gifts and you're thankful for them. Even if it's just a simple thing as being thankful for the food yet again. Even ordinary, regular prayers can be effective prayers when you're aware of God's giving them. There's an intercession for other people that we'll talk about after a bit. There is adoration that's appropriate in prayer where you let your heart go to Jesus who loved you and gave himself for you. And you tell him that in prayer. There's meditation, there's humility before God, there's worship in prayer, and you'll need them all at one time or another. It wouldn't hurt to begin practicing them before you need them. Learn from the Psalms what other prayers have sounded like, how raw and real they can be, how exalted they can take flight. Involves different kinds of prayers. You need them. They're there for you. Praying in the Spirit involves different kinds of prayer, different kinds. It flows from where you are. Prayer. Where you really are. To your source. Prayer also takes persistence in prayer. He says, pray and be alert. Always keep on praying. Don't stop praying. Keep it up. Be alert to the necessity of prayer and persisting in the reality of your situation. Persistence, right? As you persist in prayer, you're demonstrating a couple things. First, I think persistence is, shows a trust in God. Jesus tells them this parable. Jesus told his disciples a parable to show that they should always pray and not give up, right? Trust in, trust in God, right? It's too soon to give up. You can trust God to provide in the right way, at the right time, what you need. That verse, always pray and not give up, comes in the context of the parable of the persistent widow. Do you remember the story? Jesus tells about a widow who, without much influence, needed a judge to intercede on her behalf. She'd gotten a raw deal, and uh, she went to the judge for justice, and the judge kind of you know, brushes her off and sends her on her way. He doesn't really care. But Jesus says, because she kept coming, she kept coming, she kept coming, even the righteous judge will finally give her justice. But the point is that God isn't uninterested. He's not uninvolved. He's not at all like that righteous judge. And if the righteous judge can be convinced to act, you can trust God's heart to know how best to respond to your persistent prayers. You still persist, but with a sense of trust in God, who he is, what he's promised, how he's acted on your behalf. Persistence shows a trust in God, and it keeps our focus on God. Where's our hope going to come from? Where's our help going to come from? It's found in God. Therefore, Peter writes, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of a sober mind so that you can pray. Oh, don't stop praying. You know, be aware that there is, well, there is a challenge going on. There is an end coming. And in the moment now, you have an opportunity. 
but you're only going to be able to seize the opportunity as you're alert and praying. Keep your focus on God. Do you see it? It directed to him. Paul talks about one of his co-workers, a man called Epaphras, right? And he writes to the church in Colossians about this man. And he said, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends his greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. What a great example, right? He said, be like him. That's true for you and I. We need to be like him, persisting in our focus on God, not giving up. Really, prayer in the Spirit means we're going to persist. The Spirit helps us to keep on, to keep trusting, to know it's true. That verse that uh, someone shared just a few minutes ago was in Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. It's a great verse. There is this sense of of persistence in there, right? You, you knock, right? And it, it play, implies an awareness of need. You're knocking. You know what you need. You, you, you humbly request in prayer, kind of used of asking of a superior, right? You don't knock on your own door, right? You, you knock on someone else's door, perhaps your boss's door. You knock on the door of a superior. You ask. You come asking for what you need. The next one involves a little bit more, right? There's seeking. It involves not just asking, but it implies kind of an action where you're looking for that help to come. You're wanting the answer. You're getting up and looking around for it. Where is the provision that God is making for me? You're seeking. And then there's knocking, right? It, it includes asking, but it adds a sense of perseverance. You knock like someone knocking on a closed door. You keep knocking, keep knocking until they come. And the form of those words in the Greek implies a continual sense. Right? Keep on asking and it will be given you. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and it will be opened to you. Tenacity is one of our tools in prayer. Right? Persistence. Persistence. And so finally, praying in the Spirit involves praying for others. Paul says, and finally, pray for all the saints. See, the Holy Spirit's concerned about what's happening in your life, in your circumstances, but he wants to open you up to what's going on around you, to the needs around you. So last night, as I look around the room and see the people gathered here this morning, I, I prayed for every single one of you by name last night. I thought about your situations, what I know of them. I thought about, for some of you, your kids, for some of you, your grandkids, the struggles you've had. Just interesting what praying for other people does for your heart. Think about that, praying for other people. What does it do for our heart? Well, first of all, I think it shares the work of ministry that God is doing through them. I pray for you and your family. I'm sharing in what God wants to use you to do. I'm not going to take your place. I'm not going to become their parent. Or grandparent. God works th through your prayers for other people. And in a sense, you share in the ministry that God is wanting to do in their hearts and lives. It's an incredible privilege to do that. Um, and Paul invited that from the Ephesian church. He goes on to say, right after verse 18 that we'd been looking at, in verse 19, he says, pray also for me. Hey. You know, pray for all the saints and pray for me. Like in, in that number, that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And that'd be a really good prayer for each one of us to pray for, well, everybody else. That's a good prayer for me to pray for you. It's a good prayer for you to pray for me interesting, right? We think about who Paul was. He clearly knew how to pray. And he knew his spiritual armor well. He was battle tested. And yet he still asked for their prayers. He didn't say, hey, don't bother praying for me, right? Everybody, they need those prayers more than me. Just don't bother praying for me, right? 
But I think he wanted them to share in his ministry. Not, not so much maybe even that he, he thought, boy, if you don't do it, right, I'm, I'm a goner. And, and that, some of that, I think, is probably true in this. But a sense that he wanted them to share what was happening for him. Sometimes we have this kind of numbers game mentality to pray, right? And Jesus made this prayer about prayer, uh, this comment about prayer or about what happens among us when we gather together. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. And we, that's a verse pretty commonly quoted. And we think about that when our numbers are a little small. We think, oh, well, there's at least two of us. <laughs> Sometimes we take that verse and we think, well, if two or three is good, then 20 or 30 is better. And if I could get two or 300 people praying about this, then God really is going to hear my prayers and he's going to answer because my prayer is just not much. And, you know, your prayer, well, I'm thankful you're praying, but really we, we got to get some praying numbers going here. Prayer really isn't a numbers game. It's... It's a heart of God game. And there's something about joining together in prayer. Something about sharing the work together. That's how God intended the work to take place. Two or three. Share that ministry. doesn't mean we can't share requests. And it's not like I don't pray for things that hundreds of people are praying for, but don't, don't ever confuse the number of people praying with saying that two or three isn't an important number. There's a story that comes out of uh, Hudson Taylor's ministry. He's the founder of the China Inland Mission, which means that when he had a burden for China, he saw all the work taking place on the coast. And he realized that there was a whole interior of China that had almost no gospel witness and different languages and challenges in the interior of China. And he had a heart for those places that had been missed. And as the years developed, people came alongside with him and he had people, missionaries stationed in different places all through China. And then he began to see that one particular place that there was a, that they found, well, people were really responsive to the gospel in this one place and in other places with equally dedicated and, and skilled missionaries, the response wasn't the same. And he always struggled with why that was. Why was, why was this one place a spot where God was choosing to work in an unusual way? Some years later, some time later, he was back in England and he was going from church to church talking about his ministry in, in uh, China, encouraging supporters and asking people to pray. And after one meeting, a man comes up and he begins to be remarkably well informed about this one particular station where the missionaries were working and asking about one situation after another. And as he visited with this guy, he realized that this man had made a really strong connection to that work in that particularly productive area. He knew that the names of the people that were being ministered to, the circumstances that they were struggling with, the things they were planning, and had made it his work to pray 